Thank you, Diane, for having read that passage from the book of Philippians. You know, we're talking about how to rejoice in the tough times. The Apostle Paul was incarcerated in Rome, and uh, he began this book by basically telling us how to make lemonade out of the lemons of life. And then last week, he talked about how to rejoice even when you're social distancing or you're actually uh, stuck in a cell block like he was. Uh, today, we want to talk about letting your joy shine in the tough times. Now, our joy should be emanating and shining, and everybody should see it and say, wow, uh, that person, what's, what's with them? They, they're so happy and joyful. Well, I want you to learn how to let your light shine with joy, brightly. I mean, just, just brightly. Years ago, when I was uh, out west with my kids, he lived in uh, Las Vegas, and we drove up the uh, extra terrestrial highway, and it uh, leads from Las Vegas up to Area 51. And along the way, we decided uh, that we were going to go there, and, and as far as you could see ahead of you, there were no cars. It, it, this picture looks the same if you were to turn it around and point in the other direction. There were no cars, not in sight. You felt like you were really on like another planet. Well, we finally got to the Area 51, and there we met a restriction sign that basically said, no trespassing beyond this point, and so, but we knew we were there. And uh, what we stopped also at Rachel, Nevada, where there's this little restaurant out in the middle of absolutely nowhere called the Little Ailey Inn. And we stopped there for dinner and we actually had a good service. And uh, the burger I had was called the Alien Burger. And I'm sure it was just nothing more than, than beef. But uh, we had such a wonderful time on that trip. And the unique thing is I got to check off one of my bucket list items for life. Uh, I don't have to do that one again. But on our way back, it became dark. And I mean, it was dark. We're out in the middle of the desert. There's no light pollution. And you could just see a billion or trillion of stars in the sky. In fact, we could see the bands of the Milky Way. And, and uh, we parked the car. We just stopped it right on the highway. We know, knew there was no traffic coming. And we got out on the pavement. The pavement was asphalt, and it was, it was hot, and it was radiating the heat from the sun of the day, and the, the cool desert chill of the night was setting in. And we just laid there, and we looked up, and we could see the whole Milky Way, the bands going by, and we could actually see little satellites going weaving pattern across the sky because there was no light pollution. And I came to the conclusion that night that the darker the night, the brighter the light. I want you to say that. The darker the night, the brighter the light. It's true. The darker the night, the brighter the light. And if you go into an absolutely, totally dark room, and it's one of those uh, sleep study rooms where they cut out all the light, you can't even see your hand in front of your face, it takes the little tiniest bit of light to all of a sudden pop out, which would never be seen in the regular time because it's always drowned out by the rest of the light, the light pollution. I want to talk, and I, I want to talk today, through our passage, looking towards the end of it first, and working our way back to the beginning, and then working back to the end. <clears throat> it says here in verse 15 of chapter 2, You shine as lights in the world. God wants you to shine like a light in the world of darkness. And that's what he expects of us as Christians to be shining in the dark, darkness of night. Now, there are two switches that turn off the joy of life. And that is the light. The light that shines should be a joyful light in our life. There's two switches. <clears throat> the first one is your circumstances. Now, I know for the last few weeks that we've all been, like seven weeks, uh, I, I've counted, that we have all been on like lockdown and we haven't been out. And, and those of us that are living together, these circumstances are unpleasant. Some people have lost their jobs. Uh, other people, you can't go out, you can't exercise, you can't do the things that you, you've been doing. And so these circumstances have made like pretty miserable. Well, when you have miserable circumstances, <clears throat> that light switch, when you flip that, there goes your joy. There goes your joy. The other one is people. People tend to be mean-spirited or angry or upset with you. People will make your life miserable, and that robs you of your joy. I want to talk about these two, but I want to move on beyond the circumstances and the people in life. And I think that there are, there are two different secrets to turning the lights back on in your life. Turning on the joy in your life. And the first one has to do 
with your attitude. Attitude means everything. If you've got a good attitude, everything in life will go well. If you've got a bad attitude, everything will go bad. It's kind of like in Proverbs 23 where it says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So I want to talk about attitude. The Bible says, have this mind or mindset or attitude, have this attitude among you. Who's to have it? You're to have this attitude. Have this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. God has given us an attitude of joy. We have to tap into it. We just have to tap into it. Who gets it? You who, he says, who, who are uh, like the passage says here. If there is any encouragement in Christ. Now, that if there is, is a first class condition. Now, that means if there is, and in fact, there really truly is, then you go on with the rest of it. So what he is saying here is, since there is encouragement in Christ, Christ encourages us. We are encouraged by him. If I know that my Savior has gone through this path, and if I follow in his steps, I can go through it too. He says, if there is, and certainly there is, he says, since there is, any consolation from love. Sure there is. God has shed abroad the Holy Spirit's love within us. We have that shed abroad in our hearts. There is this comforting that comes from the love of God. He says on, it goes on and says, since there is this sharing in the Spirit, I have a partnership with the Holy Spirit. He is my partner. He's come and dwells within me. He produces within me a joy. He says, if there, since there is any compassion and sympathy, of course there is. He says, if there is, in the sense, and surely there is, he then adds, complete my joy. Make me happy. Make me joyful. Make me rejoice. Complete my joy. How do you do that? How do you complete the joy? He says, by being of the same mind. Being of the same mind. Paul is kind of here uh, getting himself prepared to address two factions in the church. And they're led by two ladies. And it's not a theological problem. These two ladies are having a personality conflict and they just don't see eye to eye and it's causing a division in the church. And he's begin now what he's going to talk about in chapter 4. He says, by being of the same mind, make my day, complete my joy by being of the same mind. He goes on and says, says having the same love. Same mind, same love, he goes on and says, being in full accord. The word full accord really is of the same soul. There's a sameness, a unity that there's a, that's going on here. He goes on and says, and of, the, of one mind. So it's same mind, same love, same soul, one mind. Have this attitude. And it's the attitude of unity. He's not saying uniformitarianism. He's not saying everybody's got to be the same. We're all the same cookie cutters. Because in the Christian community, we are not all the same. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, if Paul talks about the, the church as being the body of Christ, and, and the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the foot can't say, you know, to the eye, I don't need you. We're all part of the body of Christ. We need, we're one unit made up of many parts. There's diversity. That's the way it is in our Christian community. There are Christians who are Democrats. There are Christians who are Republican. No, but they have the same mind, love, full of one accord, uh, one soul. And they got this one-mindedness, one-mindedness when it comes to Christ. They could be politically butting heads, but when it comes to Christ, that's all set aside. We're all one in Christ. He's talking about uni unity here, but not uniformitarianism, because he's saying that you don't have to be all men or all women. No, there's diversity in gender. Uh, there's a, a diversity in, in social status. You can be rich or you can be poor, but when it comes to Christ, we're the same mind, same love, and same soul. We have the same passion for the same Lord. He said, complete my joy by living that out. So what attitude is he really talking about? When he's talking about, okay, I want you to have the same attitude. The attitude that he's talking about in this text is one of humility. He says, do nothing from rivalry and conceit. I think he's talking about these two ladies. They're having their rivals. One is wanting to up one over on the other. I don't like this gal because of this. She doesn't like that because of that. And we're all looking on our own interests. He says, but rather be in humility. Do nothing out of a, a rivalry and conceit, but be in humility. He says, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I think that's the definition 
of humility. It's when you know exactly who you are, how great you are, and you still prefer someone else as more significant and important than yourself. I think that's the definition of humility. When I know that uh, I am uh, at a certain level, I'm comfortable with that level, and, but I am willing to put myself underneath someone else and lift them up and make them more significant than myself. That is humility. He says, let us each, each of you not only look on his own interests, the things that are important to me, my perspective, but also on the interests of the others, what's important to them. So I know how important my position is. I know how important what I have to say is. But yet I stop and I say, wait, I want to hear what you have to say. Tell me your side. And I, I say, yours is significant. I can talk later. You talk first. You talk first. You make your point first. You do what's important to you first and I'll follow. I'll follow. You go first. That's humility. Humility. Well, how humble should we get? I mean, how, how low should we go in reaching out and, and, and trying to reach people? How low should we go? Well, he says here, just like Jesus, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mindset and have this attitude just like Jesus. Well, how was Jesus' attitude? Well, Jesus, he was equal with God. He knew just how important he was. He knew how significant he was. It's as though he was in the form of God. He was in the very form of God. His essence, he was God. He was a part of the, the Godhead in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. It says he did not count equality with God as a thing that he had to reach out for and grasp because he was already there. He was already God. He didn't have to try to do one more thing to be God. He was God. Who, though he was in that very form of God, you, you, you can't get any more significant than that. He knew exactly how significant he was. He didn't run himself down. He didn't extol himself any higher. He knew exactly who he was. And that's the way we should be. We should know exactly. Hey, you know what? I like to do art. And I, I, I consider myself an artist. I am not the greatest artist. And I am not the worst artist. But I am an artist. And I know exactly where my level is. And so when I see a really great artist, I think, wow, I can praise him. And when I see a budding artist, I can say, well, you know what? I want to help you become better than me. You see, God, Jesus, Jesus is God. And he didn't have to grasp after being better to be God. He already was. And the text says, but he made himself nothing. Can you imagine what's going on here? God the Creator, Jesus Christ, it tells us in John chapter 1, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The body of Jesus Christ that was in the manger, that body was created by Jesus Christ, the Lagos, the Word. And God Himself came down and then dwelt that body, the bo in fact, the Bible says, and He tabernacled or He tented among us in that body. He, he was incarnate in the flesh. God Almighty created everything, entered into the creation itself for a purpose. It says here, he made himself nothing from creator to a creature, and he humbled himself. How did he do that? By taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Did you notice the word likeness there? There's one glaring difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and us. That glaring difference is this. He was sinless, and you and I are not. We are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of glory. God. But in that supernatural conception of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit protected him from sin so that he was the sinless Lamb of God, the one who knew no sin, did no sin, had no sin. All those are expressions in the Bible. He was the spotless, sinless Lamb of God. Listen, he took on him the form of our humanity. Everything else was the same as us. Do you realize he got tired? Because the human body gets tired. Do you realize he had to sleep? Human body needs sleep. Do you realize he had to eat? Yeah, I bet he had taste buds. He liked certain things better than others. Yeah, those are all part of being... He came down and experienced everything we did. The Creator God, from our perspective, 
It says in being found in form as a found in a human form, being found in this body, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus said, Not my will be done, but your will be done. He was obedient to the Father's will. The Bible tells us that he learned obedience through his suffering. He suffered and he bled and he died on the cross to pay in full the price of our sins. You see how great he was. He preferred us as more significant than himself. He lowered himself so he could go to the cross and die to lift us up to the Father that we might become the children of God. How humble? We would be humble like Christ who preferred everyone else ahead of themselves. Jesus humbled himself so much that it then says, therefore, God has highly exalted him. I want to suggest to you, the cross always comes before the crown. Suffering always comes before glory. And that's true for you too. If we will humble ourselves, God will lift us up. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that if God resists the proud, if you feel like God's hand is pushing against you, check your heart. Am I a proud, arrogant person? Am I boastful? Am I focused on myself? Is it me? I'm, I'm always first. I'm first me and I'm, I'm number one. Is that what it is? Because he says he resists the proud, but he exalts the humble. He lifts them up. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, that's the name, Jesus. The word Jesus is actually the Old Testament word Joshua. Ja is uh, the word for a shortened form of Jehovah, Ja. Shua, Shua is the word saves. The name means Jehovah saves or the Lord saves. Jesus is the Savior. That's the name that is bestowed upon him. And he has salvation. He says that every knee uh, should bow. In heaven, all the angelic beings bow before Jesus. On earth, the day is coming when every human being is going to bow before Jesus. And under the earth, every demon will have to bow under his authority. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the Lord who saves to the glory of God the Father. That salvation is so important, and we will see so in a few minutes. The second secret to turning on the light of joy in your life is, first one is your attitude. When you've got a humble attitude, God lifts you up, and you rejoice. You rejoice. The second one is your actions. Your actions, what you do. You see, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he. So if you've got a good attitude, a good attitude, in your heart, you, you're, you're trusting God, you're going to do things that please God. But if you've got a bad attitude, and you're complaining and you're grumbling, your life's going to be miserable. Attitude and action. Watch how this works. Therefore, because of all the things he said before about your attitude, you need to have a good attitude. He said, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, attitude brings actions. And actions is obedience. One leads to the other. What you think is what you become. So you need to think God's thoughts after him so that you'll become godly and like Christ Jesus. He says, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, he says, I want you to actually work out your own salvation. I want you to notice something here. He didn't say in this passage, work for your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. Work it out. You can't work for your salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, For by grace are you saved. That's a gift. God gives you the grace to be saved. For by grace, a free gift, are you saved. And he says, through faith. You go through the doorway of faith. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. You don't generate it. God gives you this gift. We saw that last week in the message. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. He gives you salvation. It's not of works. You can't work for it. Some people think, hey, my, my good will outweigh my bad. The problem is the Bible says there's none that do good. No, not one. Jesus did everything good. So I need Jesus' righteousness, not my righteousness. You see, the Bible says my righteousness is as filthy rags before God. You're going to present filthy rags to God and say, God, here, accept me into heaven because I got all these filthy rags. Or do you go to and you accept Jesus Christ and, and Jesus Christ, he, his righteousness outweighs all that you've done because he's already paid for all that. You accept Jesus Christ and you present to him, said, you know, Lord, I have no righteousness of my own. 
but Jesus Christ is my righteousness. And he'll say, come on in. Come on into the kingdom that's been prepared for you. You see, you work out God's salvation. You don't work for salvation. Because it is God, it tells us, God who is at work within you. He kind of opened up your head. Now, I got a picture here on, on the screen of uh, me a few years ago. And it's kind of like a, somebody sawed my head open and opened it up and it's pouring in salvation. It doesn't work like that. In fact, they should have took a picture here when I was like eight years old, opened that head, because I was eight years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and he poured into me his salvation, the whole kit and caboodle. I got it all. I got forgiveness of sins. I got pardon, eternal life. I was justified, declared by God to be righteous forever in Jesus Christ. I, I got it all. I got the peace of God. I, I, I got it all. Everything that, that comes with salvation. Every bit of it. He gave me his salvation. Now it's all inside me. And he's saying, here, now work that out. What I put in you through Jesus Christ, my son, you get that out of your life. Make, make that happen in the world. Make that happen in your daily experience. Right now, when you're in lockdown, hey, make that happen. Get what I worked in you out. Listen, he says, it's because God, here's how you do it. God has enabled you. He actually has an enabling with you. You have the ability, people say to me sometimes, well, I just, I don't know, things are so bad, I just can't rejoice. Oh, yes, you can. He's put it in there. It's in there. You just got to find it. You got to work it out. Oh, well, yeah, I just can't forgive somebody. Well, yes, you can. It's in there. You just got to work that out. You got to figure that out. You got to work out the salvation that God has worked within you. He says he's enabled you. Everything you need to confront life, he's put inside you in your salvation. It's there. He says it's both to will. He's put it in there for you to want it. You know why I want to go to church and other people don't? He's put it in my heart. You know why I want to pray and other people don't? He's put it in my heart. Do you know why I, I, I want to give my offering to the Lord? He's put it in my heart. I sound like I can pat myself on the back, say great job. He put it in there, and all I'm doing is getting that out. I'm just getting that out. He says, both to will and to work. And when I actually when I do it, I just can't pat myself on the back yet and say, look at look what you did, because it's only because he's worked it within me. You see, first uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 5 17, it's summed up like this. I have become a new creature in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. The day I accepted Christ as eight years old, psh, the whole new came, and I've been spending a lifetime at working. I'm working out what he has already worked in, all for his own good pleasure, to please him, to please him. He says here, do all things without grumbling and questioning. You see, you work out your salvation by accepting what he did and you're rejoicing. You're not grumbling and complaining. I just can't stand another week of this shutdown. I just can't stand. And you just grumble and complain. I like this. I found this and I thought this was a great complaint department. Please take a number. All you got to do is pull that pen and all your problems go away. Yeah, and so do you. So do you. But God does not want us complaining. There's a book in the Bible that's about complaining. It's the book of Numbers. If you look at the book of Numbers, they should have named it the book of complaining because the nation Israel, like 14 different times through the book, they're complaining to God because they don't like the way he's doing things. What? He saved them from Egypt and slavery and he's delivering them. They're going to the Holy Land. They're going to the Promised Land and they're grumbling and complaining. And so he gives them a little detour for 40 years. They get to wander around grumbling and complaining. If that's the life you want, you're going to think in your heart all the time, you know, how bad things is. You're going to grumble and complain. He's going to make your life miserable because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Stop your grumbling and complaining. Stop it now. He goes on and says, why would I want to do that? Why do you want to do that? So that you can be that shining light of rejoicing. That you may be blameless. When you're working out your salvation, you're letting God live his life through you, 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 become, you start doing blameless things. You're innocent. You're a child of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse or twisted generation we live. I think he's writing about our times today. People don't even know who they are. They're so messed up, so crooked, so twisted in their minds. Men think that they're women, and women think they're men. Men want to marry men, and women want to marry women. They're messed up. 
They say there is no truth. Truth whatever I want it to be so I can make up a fantasy and I believe that is truth. No, the Bible says Jesus is the truth. It's absolute. He is the truth. God tells us. People today call evil good and good evil. Bad guys are portrayed as good guys in the movies and good guys are often the bad guys. It's all messed up. In this dark world, people want to see a light. And that's what he says. While you're living in this dark world, I want you to shine. When you work out the salvation that God has worked in you, and that comes out, people see it. I had a sleep study. In my sleep study, they put me in a room. They turned out all the lights, and I might... I couldn't see anything. That room was totally pitch black. I could put my hand right in front of my face and I could not see it. But I'll tell you what, it just took a little one of those diodes on the machine to kick on and it lit up the room. Why? Because the darker the night, the brighter the light. And the darker our world gets, the more difficult it becomes because people are losing their jobs and, and uh, because of this COVID-19 or, or they've lost a family member. The darker the, light, the night, the brighter your light. And God wants us to shine. He wants us to shine. And so we got to let our joy shine. we got to find joy in the Lord with having a positive attitude and doing the action of working out what he's worked in and that will shine and people will ask you the reason of hope that lies within you. And when they ask you your opinion, you tell them about Jesus. You tell them about Jesus. He goes on, he says, to become that shining light, you've got to hold fast to the word of life. You've got to hold fast to this book. So that in the day of Christ, I might be proud of you. Did you get that? Paul wants to be proud. He's like a parent. And he's saying to his children, I want to be proud of you, my child, my son. I want you to make me proud. All of our emotions are good. Even pride is good when it's directed, right? The real word here is boast. That I might boast. I might brag on my kid. I might brag on the Philippian church that, you, that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. When I minister to you, I, I want to be able to stand before God and say, Hey, God, look at, look at the Philippians. I, I want to be able to say, Oh, did you notice how, how bright the light is shining down at Philippi? And God looks down at Bethany and says, I, 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 you see how bright it shines at Bethany? You, you see how those people, they don't grumble, they don't complain. They just serve God. They're working out the salvation that God's worked in. Their attitude's right. Their actions are right. They're holding fast. Oh, man, that well done, good and faithful servant. Paul says this about the, the Philippians, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, you take a drink offering, we had the communion, you take the cup, and you pour it out. If you just poured it out on the ground, you'd be pouring all the contents out. It's kind of like, this is my life, and I'm pouring it out all for you, God. He says, even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm doing it for your faith. I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Even if I have to die for you. Wow. Paul knows how significant he is. He's an apostle. But he says, even if I have to go down so low for you to lift you up and die for you, I'm willing to do it. That's humility. That's what this patch is about. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. It's all about rejoicing. So how do you rejoice? Well, I want to wrap this up with these final thoughts on how you're going to rejoice. We will shine our brightest and the darkest of, on the darkest of nights when we adopt a me-third attitude and then act on it. <laughs> this is my final thoughts. It's not coming at the end of the service. It's coming right now. We will shine as the brightest of lights on the darkest of nights when we adopt this third, me third attitude, and you're going to ask, okay, what is the me third attitude? Well, when we were kids, and I was in high school, we'd, uh, we had a youth group, and in our youth group, we took a motto that was called me third. And the me third motto, uh, we would make these little buttons and pins, and we'd put them on, and we'd wear them into our high schools. And, and kids would say to us from, from the different churches, uh, different schools that all of us kids went to the same church, we'd go into our, our, our high schools and be wearing these, and people would say, what is that? Me third. And we would say, it goes like this. Jesus is first in my life. Others are second. And me, I'm third. I come in last. You'd be surprised. They got it. They thought that was awesome. That we were living for something, a cause bigger than ourselves. 
And in that living for this cause bigger than ourselves, Jesus, he came first, but that they came second, they really wanted someone who cared about them. And it became amazing. Our youth group began to really grow. And I'm not saying it was that button only. There were a lot of things going on. But that one of the things that they would come and they'd say, this is a place where I feel like I'm important. I'm significant. Why? Spirit of humility. I make myself third. I lift you up to second. We're all focusing on who's number one. Who is that number one? Me third. You see, when you kind of get this, then that's when the, the joy comes to your life. When you've got that me third attitude, Lord, you're first in my life. You preoccupy my, my mind. Uh, Lord, I, I'm running by what I know about what Jesus would do and what I do every day. I'm doing that. And, and, and I put others second. Uh, they're, they're still more important to me. And, and I'm down here third. That's when the joy comes. There is such joy in serving Jesus. And there is joy in serving others. And when you have that attitude, that's when the joy comes. I want to go into to a time of prayer just thanking God that he has given us this outline of how to rejoice in the tough times. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have the key here. We need to have the attitude that Jesus had. Even though he knew how great he was as God, he humbled himself and became so low, obedient, even to die for us, his creatures. <laughs> you said he made himself nothing. <laughs> we are nothing. But Jesus made us so important that he died on the cross for us. And he said, do as I've done. Humble yourself under, uh, under the hand of God and he will reach down and he will lift you up and we will rejoice. Lord, I know you want us to be a bright and shining light. We should not be grouchy and, uh, Lord, difficult Christians. We should be rejoicing Christians. And so this week, Help us make our light shine in the darkest of nights by having the joy of Jesus Christ worked out in that salvation that you've worked in, that we get it out and touch other people's lives. And they say, wow, you are a bright spot of hope in your rejoicing, and you've brought it to my life. Bless us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.